Electability? <laughs> Schmelectability. That doesn't work. Not at all. Ask any of the 21 Democrats running for president in 2020 what the single most important thing they need to do next November is, and you'll get one clear answer. Beat Donald Trump. Now, they won't agree on which of them is best positioned to do that, or exactly how it should be done, only that it must be done. Which brings me to a word you're going to be hearing a lot about over the next year or so, electability. It seems so simple. Electability is just the ability to get elected. It's, it's right there in the word, electability. Except the whole notion of electability isn't simple, not at all. Let me offer an explanation for that from the not at all distant past. When Donald Trump started looking like a semi-serious candidate for the Republican presidential nomination in 2016, the electability police, I wonder if they have a badge, emerged. We can't nominate a thrice married, six business bankruptcies under his belt reality TV star whose celebrity is built on the two word phrase, you're fired, can we? Doing that would hand Hillary Clinton the presidency, and it might cost Republicans their House and Senate majorities. Trump as the party's nominee could end the GOP as we know it. Donald, uh, you're not going to be able to insult your way to the presidency. I do think Donald Trump would be a disaster for the country and a disaster for our party, and I think we'd suffer the worst defeat since 1964. Mm -hmm. He says the worst things possible about immigrants and women, and he's a complete idiot when it comes to Mideast policy. So I think over time, common sense will prevail. He's a showman. He's really good at that. Quote. For the sake of our party and country, we must move to overcome the divisiveness and vulgarity Donald Trump has brought into the political arena, or we will certainly lose our chance to defeat the Democratic nominee and reverse President Obama's failed policies." End quote. That was failed 2016 candidate Jeb Bush when announcing his endorsement of Ted Cruz's campaign against Trump that year. Of course, then Trump won the Republican nomination. Then he won the presidency, and Republicans held their majorities in the House and the Senate, which would seem to suggest that Trump had plenty of electability. I thank you very much. That brings me to the current debate within the Democratic Party about which candidate is best positioned to beat, you guessed it, Donald Trump in November 2020, and whether that question should even matter when picking a candidate. Now, voters say it does. In a recent Monmouth University poll, 56% said they would prefer a candidate with a good chance of beating Trump, even if they disagreed with that candidate on most issues. Hmm. Just 33% said they wanted someone who agreed with them on most policies, even if that candidate wasn't running as strong against Trump. And Joe Biden, the former vice president and the 2020 frontrunner for the Democratic nomination, has built his entire candidacy on the idea that A, beating Trump is all that matters, and B, he is the candidate best positioned to do it. As the Washington Post, Eugene Robinson wrote recently of Biden, quote, Joe Biden begins his presidential campaign with a lead over the crowded Democratic field and a simple message the nation can immediately grasp. I can stop the madness. I can beat Donald Trump. Biden's claim is based, generally speaking, on his long background in politics. He was first elected to the Senate in the 1970s, spent eight years in the 2000s alongside Barack Obama in the White House, and combined with his record of working with Republicans and Democrats to find solutions for the problems facing the country. The way you beat the ultimate outsider, Donald Trump, is with the ultimate insider goes the Biden argument. Americans tried something radically different in 2016, and they don't like what they got. Biden represents a return to normalcy. He knows how to do this. He's done it all before. <sighs> There's a problem with that logic, of course. It relies on a whole lot of assumptions. Let me list just a few. Number one, voters want someone with a long record in politics to replace Trump. Number two, the best choice to replace a septuagenarian white male president is a septuagenarian white male former vice president. Three, voters want someone with a record in Congress of working across the political aisle. Truth be told, there isn't much actual proof that Biden would be the strongest general election challenger to Trump anyway. In fact, in a CNN poll released in April, former Texas Congressman Beto O'Rourke had the biggest lead, 10 points, over Trump in a series of hypothetical 2020 matchups. Biden led Trump by six points, which is the same margin that Vermont Senator Bernie Sanders, 
who is seen by many as the least electable Democratic candidate in the field, led Trump. Huh. Now, it's of course possible that Biden would actually be the strongest nominee against Trump. Biden is well known and generally well liked by Democrats and Republicans. And judging from the president's totally over the top reaction to Biden's candidacy, multiple tweets in a single day bashing Sleepy Joe, Trump is worried about the prospect of facing Biden in a general election. But you only need to look as far as President Hillary Clinton or President John Kerry, long may he reign, to see the danger for Democrats in nominating a candidate solely because they are regarded as the candidate who is the most electable. Because electability is in the eye of the beholder, there's just no way to objectively measure what candidate has it and which don't. And that goes double for an election that's more than a year away. And that is the point. We make New Point episodes every Tuesday and Thursday. Check them all out.